fall season kickoff here at Washington County Library. Club Book is pro a program of MELSA, the Metropolitan Library Service Agency, made possible through the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and coordinated by Library Strategies, which is part of the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library. Before I introduce tonight's guest, I'd like to recognize our program partners. Thank you to Valley Booksellers for handling our book sales tonight. <laughs> and Thanks, as always, to our lead media sponsors, Minnesota Public Radio and MinPost, for their continued promotional support. <laughs> our guest tonight, chart-topping mystery author Karen Slaughter, has written nearly 20 thrillers to date. Her books have sold a staggering 35 million copies in more than 120 countries. She is best known for the Grant County series set in rural Georgia, which launched her career in 2001. It centers around a small, pediatrician, a small town pediatrician and a part-time coroner, Dr. Sarah Linton, and her husband, the local chief of police. Slaughter also writes the Atlanta series, which follows special agents at the Georgia Bureau of, special, of Investigation. Karen Slaughter has also written several well-received standalones. Three of those, Cop Town, The Good Daughter, and Pieces of Her, are currently in development for film or television adaptations. Pieces of her hit shelves just a week ago today. In a starred review, book list says, readers will find themselves totally immersed in Slaughter's suspenseful, alternating storylines and won't want either of them to end. Please join me in welcoming Karen Slaughter. Thanks for coming. Um, are the, all these mics working? I've also got one here, so uh, if anything happens to me, it's going to all be recorded in one way or the other. Um, I'm really happy to be in a library. It's, it's beautiful here um, with the waterfall. I've never seen that in a library. Uh, I really uh, have been going to the bathroom a lot for some reason. Um, <laughs> But it's great. I have, I have one little housekeeping note. Does anyone here um, have family in uh, St. Louis at my event last night? No? Well, she said you were going to be here, so I guess she lied. Um, no? No? No hands? Are you, are you just too embarrassed? Okay. Well, I thought she looked a little shifty. Um, so what I normally do is I talk a little bit about libraries and why I love libraries, and then... I talk about myself because I like to do that. I think I'm very fascinating. Um, and also, people often, when they first meet me, they usually say, wow, we thought you'd be taller. Uh, and they expect me to be in leather with knives and uh, chains and things. Uh, and uh, so I like to explain why that is not the case. Uh, really, it's romance writers you need to look out for. Uh, <laughs> You know, I think we, we uh, have the great pleasure as thriller writers of getting all that murderous stuff out on the page, and we tend to be very laid back because of that catharsis. Um, also, children's book writers can be violent alcoholics, so um, just be careful. So why do I love libraries? Because I, I grew up in the library, basically. Uh, I was feral uh, until the age of uh, 33. Um, but I love libraries, and we had the bookmobile when I was a little, little kid, and the bookmobile would come, and that was my favorite day of the week, and I'd run out there, and I'd, I'd be able to get two books, and I could, you know, read them repeatedly throughout the week until I could get the next ones, and I just loved it. I mean, I absolutely loved it. There, there was one problem, though, and that's the woman who drove the bookmobile was also our bus driver for school. And I'm the youngest of three girls, and my sisters are basically high-functioning psychopaths. Uh, and uh, so by the time I came along, you know, I remember first grade, first day of school, I was so happy. I get on the bus, and she looks at me, and she looks at where I came from, and she says, you know what, you're in the front seat on silent bus until you graduate or get arrested. <laughs> 
Uh, but she was in charge of the bookmobile, and she was also a chain smoker. So whenever I smell uh, cigarette smoke, I just really want to read. Uh, but my sisters were really awful. They weren't readers, and they knew that I loved this. And if you have siblings, you'll understand that they always find the thing you love the most and try to take it away from you. Uh, and so they would do things like turn down the pages or one time they put gum in my book so that I would be on suspension. I couldn't get a book for a month. They were just awful, awful uh, human beings. Um, and if, if you're part of a family, you understand what I'm saying. I mean, yeah, sure, I love them, but they were awful. Uh, so when we got to, we moved to a new town and we got a permanent library, this was my place of worship. I love that place. Um, I will admit it was the only air-conditioned building in town, so that had something to do with it also, growing up in the Deep South. Um, when we were kids, you could still kick your kids out of the house and lock the door during the summer, and no one would report you because they understood. And so that's what would happen. You know, that door would lock behind us, and we were told, there's the hose if you get thirsty, and if you need accommodations, there's the woods. Uh, and so we would eventually end up at the library. And, you know, some of my earliest loves, Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret. Um, you know, any Judy Bloom, really. Nancy Drew, Encyclopedia Brown. These were put in my hands by librarians who knew me, who, you know, called me by my name, who understood the types of books I loved to read, and they really fostered that love I had of reading. They also tried to pry from my hands books like Lace, uh, The Thorn Birds, uh, Flowers in the Attic. I love those books. I did not realize until I was in college that it was incest and it was bad. Uh, this is not because I'm from the South. It's because my generation of women was, was raised on this, this type of book. Um, you know, and we had General Hospital where Luke and Laura, uh, Luke violently raped Laura, but then he married her and the, because they fell in love. I mean, those are the sorts of stories that I grew up reading. Uh, and I have the library to thank for that. <laughs> So I also try to support libraries as an author. I drag my friends into it. I make them do events. We give block grants to libraries uh, that are trying to do a good job, you know, reading circles for kids, that kind of thing. I don't particularly like children. Uh, I think toddlers in particular can be real assholes. Um, <laughs> but, you know, a kid who reads is going to do better in school. They're going to stay out of trouble. They're probably going to go to college. They're going to graduate, and they're going to pay into Social Security so that I have something to fall back on. <laughs> so it's very atavistic that I am supporting libraries like this, because I, I don't want children in prison. I want them paying taxes. <laughs> Call me crazy. So that's why I love libraries. Um, and w this wonderful library, I mean, I have to tell you, I'm in libraries a lot. Even the staff bathrooms are really nice here. Usually it's just a bucket. Um, so you're really spoiling them is what I'm saying. You could probably save some money there. But uh, other than that, it's perfect. So I'm going to talk a little bit about me now, um, a little bit more actually, for about 30 minutes. Uh, don't worry, I'll let you ask questions. The first one is going to be, when is the next Will Trent novel? I'm just preparing you. Um, <laughs> I will say that if you need to read pieces of her repeatedly because there is a clue hidden in that novel that explains the next Will Trent novel, so if you do not buy it and read it, uh, you'll be missing out. You might want to get several copies. Uh, <laughs> but I mentioned that I'm the youngest of three girls, and, and my father, uh, of course, loves me the most. I'm clearly the youngest, but also the prettiest and the thinnest, um, <laughs> and the most successful. And if my sisters don't agree with me, you can go to their book signing. Uh, but growing up, my dad was such a great storyteller. He wasn't much of a reader. He's still not a reader. He grew up during a, a time uh, where you couldn't sit around reading because that was considered lazy. Uh, so he worked at a cotton mill, and he, he did all kinds of different jobs as, as a kid 
to help support his family. That was expected. His mother grew up during the Great Depression uh, when she died. She had approximately 11 million packets of sweet and low she had taken from various cafeterias uh, that we had visited. Uh, she was a very frugal woman. And uh, they, they lived a very hard scrabble life when my dad was growing up. Uh, he was one of eight brothers and sisters. And they were literally so poor that they would squat in shacks. The whole family would squat in these one and two room shacks. Uh, and then when the owner came, they were told to move on to the next one. Uh, my grandfather was not a nice guy. Uh, my dad is the polar opposite of him, but my grandfather was kicked out of the clan for not taking care of his family. I had no idea they had standards, apparently. Um, <laughs> Apparently my grandfather couldn't meet those. So this just tells you how hard my grandmother's life was and my father's. I mean, a lot of times they would have to dig up roots for soup and boil that and that was dinner. Um, my grandmother's recipe for Brunswick stew starts with uh, take 12 plump squirrels uh, and that, that was dinner. Squirrel is very greasy in case you're wondering. I do not recommend it. Um, but that was their life and the way they kind of took themselves out of this horrible situation was to tell each other stories. And my father still carries on that tradition. He t talks about his family. It's a very typical Southern thing to do to make fun of your family, uh, which is why I'm doing it here. It's not out of meanness. It's just because they deserve it. Um, <laughs> But he would tell us all kinds of, of, of things, usually cautionary tales, like the little girl who left open the refrigerator door and died. <laughs> or the little girl who touched the thermostat and died. <laughs> and part of the way he would relate to us was scaring us. I mean, this was something he took great delight in. Uh, and, you know, he also would grab us behind the knee in that place that's very, very um, hurtful, but also you laugh at the same time. Uh, for some reason. My sisters and I, we all limp when it rains now because of this, because he was just always, he thought that was really funny. Uh, and I was doing a, an event a few years ago, and this woman came up to me, and she said, do you remember me from elementary school? Because I remember your dad, you were telling that story, and I remembered your dad when this one time we were having a sleepover, and he scared us to death. And I said, you're going to have to narrow it down. <laughs> Because my dad was the dad who, you know, at Christmas, you know, dads get on the roof and they knock and they're ho ho. He would do that in the summertime, <laughs> and he would say, "Wow, that's little. The, that's the goblin who eats little girls who don't listen to their daddies." <laughs> um, but so we had this this uh, sleepover apparently, and uh, this woman said to me, I've, "I've remembered it all my life because your dad." Uh, had a ladder against the window and right when we were all about to fall asleep he put on a sheet a ghost sheet not the other kind he put on a sheet he climbed up the ladder and he started scratching on the window and we all screamed so much we couldn't go to sleep that night and I said you're gonna have to narrow it down <laughs> Because that's what he did all the time. And, and so when I was about six years old, I thought, well, I want to tell stories too. And so I started writing them down. And he would give me a quarter for every book I finished. It had to be finished. When that, so that was a good lesson for me in finishing a book. Uh, and most of them were about what I knew, which was my sister's. And because I was the youngest, I couldn't rely on physical strength. It had to be psychological torture. That was my only way to get them. And so the, the stories were all about my sisters being mutilated uh, or kidnapped, and no one really cared. Uh, the, the theme of the books was basically I ended up being an only child. My father loved these books. He could not wait for them to come out. He was the first in line. Uh, weirdly, in the 12 and under range, no one was interested in buying these books, but he, he was absolutely a, a lover of these novels. He still has some, he, and, uh, you know, he could probably put them on eBay. Maybe he's going to put them on eBay. I don't know. Uh, but he also would tell us stories about our families, and, and one of the, the prime times for getting stories about our family was when we would go on vacation. Now, if you live in Georgia and you say vacation, that means the Florida Panhandle, which is the Redneck Riviera. <laughs> it was six hours from our house. My dad made the drive in five. If we had to go to the bathroom, he would slow down to 20. 
Uh, and whoever laughed at that had to clean up the car once we got to Florida. So it was me and my sisters in the back seat, and I was the youngest, so I was in the middle, squeezing everything together. I've got amazing thigh strength because of this, but, you know, and invariably it was, she touched me, she breathed on me, she's thinking about me. And my dad was in the front seat driving, and he would have a scotch in one hand and a cigarette in the other. And he, still, he would manage to slap our legs, to you know, <laughs> just reach around like a rubber band and snap at our legs to try to get us to stop fighting. Uh, and you know, the joke was on him because it was so hot because he wouldn't turn the air on because it wasted gas that our legs were melted into the vinyl seat, <laughs> so we couldn't even feel the slaps. <laughs> So what he would do, I guess to keep us from killing each other or maybe to keep him from killing us or himself, was he would tell us stories. And my particular favorite was about my Aunt Bert. She was a very godly woman. She was at church every time the door opened, and she loved being there. She loved going on hospital visits with the preacher, and she loved most of all hearing about all the awful medical ailments that people had so that she could go to her tea party afterward and tell all her friends, uh, well, bless his heart, you know, he has this thing wrong with his, uh, his back, you know, and they think he was robbing a store when it happened. You know, she always had some kind of story. And she was, she was unquestionably devout. The church did love her. And one thing about her was she had a hair lip. Now, this is something that's genetic. It's in my family, and it can be repaired quite easily medically. Uh, but she would not get it repaired. And the, the people in the, the congregation thought it was because of money. So they took up a collection so she could have this hair lip repaired. And she wouldn't do it because she said Jesus touched her on the lip, and she was not going to mess with Jesus. This was a lie. What she loved was she worked on the church's money-making side, which was the bingo parlor. And she would stand up there, and she would call out the balls, and she would say, be hoardy whore. <laughs> and she'd look around and just challenge anybody. <laughs> and she'd say, I shitty shit. And I remember as a kid hearing my dad say this and thinking, if you write stories, you can curse. <laughs> and my books are filled with curse words because of that. I have my Aunt Bert to thank, rest her soul. I also had an early interest in crime novels. You know, I loved The Stranger Beside Me, Helter Skelter. I, just, I love that kind of thing. I read every Anne Rule book. Um, I just, I'm... I'm from the age of eight when I first read A Stranger Beside Me, which was highly inappropriate and far too mature for me, I loved, loved reading crime novels, and I loved hearing crime stories. And I think I get this from my grandmother, because my grandmother loved this magazine called True Crime Magazine. Do you guys remember? I think it still exists today. It's awful. It's like snuff porn. I mean, there's just pillaging and raping and murdering and you know when my grandmother was reading it it was a bunch of men writing stories and they would write at the end she should have listened to her father or her husband was right you know they, they were those kinds of stories my grandmother loved this magazine so what she would do is every Sunday when the, the new edition was out for the week before church she would drive to Piggly Wiggly on the bad side of town because Kroger didn't carry that trash right and she would get this magazine and then she would go to church, and she would go to church for three or four hours because this was a, a real holy roller type of church. You know, the, the preacher uh, before the one that I knew had died from handling snakes. And my grandmother said, oh, preacher didn't believe. You know, it's so sad. Uh, but this was a real hardcore Southern Baptist church, and it was not air-conditioned. They kept the windows closed so the Holy Spirit wouldn't get out. Uh, <laughs> And it, would, it was just sweltering hot, but she would sit through that. Then she would go home. I mean, I'm sorry. Then she would go to the Kroger. She would buy food for Sunday dinner. And then she would go home, and she would cook our Sunday dinner, and she would read this magazine cover to cover while it was cooking. So when we would show up, she would hide it under her chest of drawers in her bedroom. And we would kiss her, and then we were expected to disappear until we were called for supper. And we would always go to her bedroom and get that magazine. <laughs> and then we'd go outside. She had these plum trees. We'd sit under these plum trees, and we'd read this magazine to each other and scare the crap out of ourselves. 
And every Sunday night, we cried ourselves to sleep because we were just so terrified. Our parents thought we were naughty, right? Because they were like, well, something must have happened in Sunday school that really touched the darkness in their hearts, right? <laughs> but we were just afraid there was going to be a hook on the door. It was terrifying, and, and she loved it so much, and I think I get that bloodlust from my grandmother. Um, but she also was a typical Southern grandmother. She was very difficult to please, and, and she loved her children and her grandchildren. She loved them more than life, but not to their face. You know, she was always kind of disappointed. My, even when my father managed to he, he, he's this great American bootstrap story. He pulled himself up into the middle class. He gave us a great life, but he did it from selling used cars, so don't be too impressed. Um, but my grandmother would say to him, well, maybe one day you'll own a new car sales lot uh, instead of used cars. You know, that's just, she was always aiming for the next thing, uh, especially for us. But when Christmas came along, and my dad bought her what he thought she would want, which was a frying pan. And she found out how much the frying pan cost, and she t made him hang it on the wall because she said something that expensive was art. <laughs> she was just mortified. And when she died, we found these beautiful, beautiful hats in her closet that she never wore because she said they were just too pretty and too expensive for her to wear. Uh, but that, that's, that's how she was. And so the Christmas after what we called the frying pan incident, uh, my father had this great idea where he was going to let us decide what to get her for Christmas because he figured that the kids would get less heat if she was disappointed. I guess he'd never met us. Uh, <laughs> but we decided, me mostly, because I paid attention, that we were going to get my grandmother a subscription to True Crime magazine. And so we came around to Christmas morning, and my dad had this rule that we couldn't open gifts until after breakfast. And his breakfast, not ours, his breakfast, which ended around noon. <laughs> and so we're sitting at the table, and I just couldn't stand it anymore. I was about to explode. I was, Grandma, Grandma, please, 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 let us, tell, let, let us tell you what we got you for Christmas. And she said, okay, already disappointed. And I said, we got you a subscription to True Crime Magazine so you don't have to go to the Piggly Wiggly on the bad side of town. And she just stared at me. And I, I noticed her lower lip started to quiver. And then she put her head in her hands and she started to cry. We had never seen her cry like this. I mean, she was really crying. And we thought, my God, we've, we finally found something that she really wanted. We, we finally have pleased her. And my father stood up and he put his hands on her shoulders and he said, Mama, are you okay? And she turned around and looked at him and said, I do not want the postman to know I read that. <laughs> so he had to, it was, I think it was about $25 for the subscription. It was 40 to cancel it. <laughs> so this was something that happened quite a lot. Um, but that, that's just how my grandmother was. I mean, she didn't want people to know her business. She didn't want them to know about this bloodlust. It's very unladylike. And I think she'd be mortified that I was standing up here talking about this <laughs> and telling all her secrets. Because it's a, in, in the South, the one big difference, I think, between the North and, and the South is that in the South, gossip is your currency. In the North, gossip is very rude. But every time two Southerners get together, they always gossip about people they know in common, what they're up to. I mean, that's just a common thing to do. And my grandmother's church, which I, I told you was pretty hardcore, was a place that she loved to take us because she really wanted us to be believers. And my parents were loath to let her take us to this church because it was really hardcore. Uh, so they would only let her take us on Easter. And so Easter would come every year, and we'd have to get dressed up in the, the pink dresses and the white hose and the ruffled underwear. Very strange. My sister was 16. Um, she got so many phone numbers. But uh, we would get dressed up, and really the only reason my grandmother wanted us there was the only reason most grandmothers want their grandchildren to meet their friends is to show how clean and well-behaved we were. So we had to put on this entire show for her for three hours. And the most critical part was the end, where she introduced us to her friends. And she would say, 
this is Mrs. Smith, this is Mrs. Jones, and we would have to say, good morning, Mrs. Smith or Mrs. Jones. It's very nice to meet you again. That was the script. We all had to do that, one after the other. And as soon as the woman would turn around, my grandmother would say something like, well, you know she drinks. <laughs> that son of hers, not right in the head. Husband's a cheat. All the time she had these deep, dark secrets about people. And if you read my books, all my characters, no matter how nice they can look in their Sunday best, have deep, dark secrets. And I have my grandmother to thank for that. <laughs> the last thing I want to say about my grandmother, when she passed away, it was really hard for all of us because we did love her so much. And, you know, my father did his best to try to give her a nice life after she had had such a, a horrible one. And... and you know, he helped her as much as he could. She worked from the age of 12, um, but as an adult woman, she couldn't get a credit card in her name. She couldn't get uh, a home loan, a car loan. She couldn't qualify for any kind of credit uh, because of the time period. Uh, and my dad had to sign on loans for her when he was in his 20s. So, you know, a 20-something-year-old man was more dependable in the bank's eyes than a woman who'd worked all her life. So that, that was really difficult for her, but it was something my father was happy to do because he wanted to support her. And when she passed away, he decided that the best way to honor her would be for us to visit her graveside every Easter Sunday. That was her special day. And so that's what we would do. We'd all get in the car. We'd all be dressed in our ruffled underwear. Very uncomfortable to sit on, by the way, in case, you, in case some of you men don't know. Some do. But uh, <laughs> so we would get in the car, and we'd drive to the Sodom Cemetery, where all the slaughters are buried, which is appropriate. Some of my uncles will tell you they love sodomy. Uh, but uh, we would park. And we would go into the cemetery. Now, if anybody's from the South, you can probably verify that, that this is the absolute truth. There was a preacher buried in this cemetery with a telephone because he was afraid the rapture would happen and he would be forgotten about. And I guess this is like Harry Potter being the most uh, fantastic and powerful magician in the world, but he still needs eyeglasses. This preacher thought that the rapture would come and he'd need to phone a friend, right? <laughs> so that it wasn't a cell phone. It was a legitimate telephone rented by the church, by the way, from Bell South, because you still had to pay like $8 to rent them. And there was a telephone line coming out of the grave and going to a telephone pole. Hand of my heart, this is true. And he was buried up here, and my grandmother was down here, closer to the parking lot. But every time, my dad made us go under that telephone pole, because he knew it freaked us out. <laughs> and he would say, oh, no, let's go this way. Oh, I think I see something over there. And, and we, we would end up under that telephone line, and we would walk under it, like, the, you know, just shuddering. And one time, he had a bell behind his back. <laughs> Remember those old telephones sounded like bells, didn't they? And he rang that bell, and um, I think the medical term is hysterical blindness. <laughs> We've all three been in all kinds of therapy, scream therapy, reversion therapy, water therapy, all of these different kinds of therapies, and we can't really put together the pieces of how we ended up back in the car, on the floorboard, piled on top of each other, and covered in urine. <laughs> And then my father was laughing so hard, he wet himself, too. <laughs> so when people say, your books really scare me, I think, well, at least you're not covered in urine. <laughs> so that's kind of why I am the way I am. Um, you know, I will say one more thing about my sisters, you know, being the youngest and having to devise uh, ways to protect myself. I would keep a lot of secrets. I would always um, read my d sister's diaries. Sometimes I would make editorial suggestions. Um, but mostly I would spy on them. Uh, and, and this was my way of protection because, you know, a typical uh, conversation might be my father saying, did you do your homework? And I would say, yes, sir. And he would say, okay, well, let me see your homework. And I would say, Oh, let me look for it, but meanwhile, you know, Dad, I'm really upset because I saw my sister kissing this boy the other night. And then suddenly no homework was ever checked. 
So I, I like to dole those secrets out in my book, too, in the same way. You know, those are where the twists and turns come from, is me knowing all these secrets about my characters. Um, and my sister actually heard me do this, uh, talk about these sorts of things at a book event, and I promised her that I would tell this one story because she thinks it puts me in a bad light. Even after all these years, she doesn't understand as the youngest, I will never be in the bad light. <laughs> she was going to go to bed, and I thought it would be hilarious to hide under her bed and grab her ankle. <laughs> And I waited under that bed from 3 o'clock. Our parents were at a, a party in the uh, late afternoon. And I waited under that bed, and I read a book. I read her diary. I uh, made some notes. Uh, yeah, I fell asleep. I took a nap. Uh, I sneezed a lot. She's not a very clean person. And then finally she came to bed, and I grabbed her ankle. And she screamed so loud that it scared me. <laughs> And when my parents came home, I was sobbing, hiding in the closet with my blanket. It was her blanket, but I, it was mine, too. And uh, if you're an older sibling, you'll understand what happened next. She got in trouble for scaring me. <laughs> so I'm going to warn you, I have never, ever suffered any consequences from scaring people. <laughs> And I'm not going to feel bad if you couldn't sleep at night. So, so that, that is why. Because, uh, you know, my, my very uh, wonderful family had never punished me for being mean and cruel. Um, so Pieces of Her is a story also about a, a family. Um, and you, people always say to me, well, and, and to most authors, where do you get your ideas? And most of the time, we lie, because we don't really know where the idea came from. It just was something percolating in our minds, and suddenly we thought, well, what if, what if? And then suddenly we have an idea for a book. Uh, but with me, uh, with Pieces of Her, I, I had these two characters. You know, I write about father-daughter relationships a lot, because they're easy. Mother-daughter relationships are not easy. You know, fathers think their daughters are perfect. Mothers know better. <laughs> And so I started out with Andrea, she's 31 years old, and Laura, she's in her mid-50s, which is still very young. Uh, and I wanted a line or a piece of dialogue or a thought that would pull me into who these characters are. That's how it always is with my novels, even when I'm writing Will Trent. There's always something Sarah has an exchange with someone or there's this one focal point that I think of when I'm thinking about what the story's going to be. It's sort of like a pin the tail on the, the donkey. And for me, the line in this book is something Andy is thinking. Andrea, she goes by Andy. She, and she thinks, it is a truth universally understood that a mother can say to her daughter, your hair looks good today. And what the daughter hears is your hair has looked awful every day until now. <laughs> I see a lot of women nodding. Um, women are daughters too. Mothers are daughters too. They have heard this same thing. Um, but I, I, I wanted to write a little bit about that. I also wanted to write about helicopter parents. Every country I've ever toured in, there has been a phrase equivalent to helicopter parent. In Denmark, they're called curling parents after the Olympic sport of curling, you know, where they clear the way for the puck. Um, <laughs> But the book opens, like a lot of my books open, with just a normal, everyday kind of thing, because that's what usually happens when people are victims of crime. You know, spoiler alert, you're in the first chapter of one of my books. Something bad is going to happen to you. <laughs> so Laura is having a conversation with Andy that maybe many of you have either had with your adult children or been on the receiving end of as an adult child, an elder millennial. Uh, she's saying to Andy... I think I made a mistake. I think I made things too easy for you. You're going to need to move out of the house. You're going to need to stop living above my garage apartment and start paying your student loan bills down. And you need a career instead of just this night job where you work at night and you sleep during the day and steal cheese from my refrigerator. You know, you have to do this. And, and, and part of this, my thinking about this dynamic was because a friend of mine recently, um, her son, who was 28 years old, went on another internship, this one in Spain, 
according to his social media, he was doing a lot of uh, interesting things with a, a lot of young ladies over there. Uh, not so much working at his job. Uh, and he came back home, and she picked him up at the airport, and instead of going to the house, they went to this one-bedroom condominium. And she said, oh, I didn't tell you I sold the house? And he said, no. And so she took him inside, and he was looking around, and he said, there's only one bedroom. I can't sleep on the couch. And she said, exactly. <laughs> so there are two ways to get your children out of the house. One is to sell it. And two is to have happen what happens to Andy and Laura, which is they're having this conversation, and a man with a gun walks into this diner. And this is a familiar thing for us. I mean, it happens. I knew when I was writing this scene, it would probably happen while I was touring. It might happen multiple times, because that's just the nature of the world we live in now. Uh, if I had written a scene like that, where a gunman walks into a, a, a diner and starts shooting 20 years ago, the whole focus of the book would have been on that one incident. But because it's so common, it was, I was able to use it as a device to open up a larger story. And so the larger story is, when this guy starts shooting, everybody runs. Andy cowers to protect herself, but Laura stands up and faces the gunman. Now, Andy sees her mom do this. Her mom, who baked cupcakes and was the PTA president, was a cool mom. She listened to Beyonce, uh, <laughs> who sewed a dress for her 16th birthday Netherfield ball party. Uh, she sees her mom standing up to this gunman. And then Laura does something so shocking, Andy realizes she has no idea who this woman is. And as more bad things happen, and Andy's forced to get away from her mother. She's on the road. She's being pursued by a gunman. Uh, she realizes everything her mother has told her about herself is an absolute lie, and that her mother may not be a good person and might even be a criminal. And so that's really what the book is about, is figuring out who this woman is. So it's, the clues are the pieces of her. It's not pieces like chop, chop, chop. <laughs> Though, if, if you thought that because it's one of my books, I understand. <laughs> so I, I think that um, maybe we can have people ask some questions if you like. Yeah? My first book was published, I wanted to be published before I was 30. I thought that was really old. I had no idea. <laughs> um, and I was, my first publishing contract was signed when I was 29. And my first book came out in 2001. However, it took 10 years to get to that point. And, you know, I, I love my dad, and when I graduated from high school, he, he did the best thing for me. He said, sweetheart, you can do anything you want with your life. You can be anything you want, but you cannot live at home. <laughs> and so I took several jobs. Uh, I was an exterminator. Uh, I was a house painter. I worked in a sign company. But all the time I, I had any free time, I was always writing. I was in college, which will make you hate writing in addition to reading. I was not a good student. I dropped out. Um, and I recommend if you do drop out to write a book uh, that becomes an international bestseller because that really worked out for me. Um, but it took a lot of sacrifice to get to that point. And over those 10 years, I wasn't writing the same book. I was writing different books. I was learning my voice. And actually, my first book uh, that I got my current agent with, I've had her since the, the first published novel, uh, was rejected. I thought I had to write Gone with the Wind. There's a reason why that's not a really successful path. <laughs> um, and I, I, I had this idea about being a Southern author, and, and nobody wanted to, to buy the book. And I was crushed, but she sent me the uh, rejection letters so I could read them. She, redact she redacted the names, right, because she knew I'd call them and cuss them out. <laughs> um, and they said, we love the writing. We don't love the story. And I thought, well, that's, that means that they like it, so I have another chance here. And my agent asked what I wanted to do next, which is very meaningful. Agents only get paid when they sell things, so I thought if she still, still wants to represent me, I need to take advantage of this. And I said, I always wanted to write a thriller. And that's when I wrote Blindsided. It was, um, I had 17 <coughs> days with holidays and vacation time and all that that I could take off. I'd, I'd never really even, I, uh, they had accumulated because I don't vacation well. 
Um, and in 17 days, I wrote The Bones for Blindsided. And then, of course, I had to go back and edit it and all that. But I really, I'm not a, a, a navel-gazing kind of author. I don't talk about the journey of the character and all the feels. Uh, but writing Sarah and Jeffrey and Lena, I, I found my voice. I really loved it. I love writing. I'm so passionate about it. I want to get better with every book. I want to do something different with every book. And so, you know, I've been very lucky in my career. I have the ability to do that. But that, that's basically my publishing story is a lot of rejection and one yes. When, and I always say to people who want to be writers, who want to be published, you just need one yes of that. I mean, at some point, you have to talk about the id of the writer. Um, Jack Reacher is not like that, but, you know, Harry Bosch and most every character has some kind of questioning. I think that it, it, it's what you said, that real people have that. And as an author, when you start to write a book, you have to make a decision about how honest you want to be, right? I love Janet Ivanovich. I think she is fantastic at what she does. I couldn't tell you if the last book was about Joe or Ranger. I do know when it's in the same book, it makes me very uncomfortable. Um, <laughs> but she's great at that. It, but I'm not that kind of writer. I want to be as honest as I can about human beings. You know, Will has a lot of self-doubt. Um, people around him don't necessarily know that because you're in his head. Uh, a lot of times he'll have a, a conversation with Amanda or Sarah even, and he's having all these feelings, and then he'll just say, okay, well, should we eat pizza or hamburgers, you know? Um, so you do get that insight. Um, and, and I feel like writing about violence, particularly violence against women, I feel a, a great responsibility when I write those scenes. And I want to show all the emotional response and reaction. And the fact is, I speak to police officers an, uh, an awful lot, law enforcement, FBI, DEA. And you know, they're tough guys and women, but they do have scars from these crimes. And so this is sort of from my conversations with them about the different things. And I like to put that in the novel because I think it, it gives it some humanity. And I, I always want to make sure every single character feels real to the reader, even if it's the guy who's giving directions. I want to make that character feel real because I try to write as realistically I, as I can in the realm of fiction. I, I, I wrote another book set in that same time period called Cop Town with different characters because um, I had so many stories. And I just, I, I loved it. I don't know that I could go back with Amanda and Evelyn uh, but I could definitely go back with Cop Town because I, I just, I love that story so much. I'd love to take it into the late 1970s when we had the Atlanta child murders, uh, Wayne Williams, uh, the presumptive killer, because I was alive during that time and I've always been fascinated by it. They wouldn't tell us what was going on. We just knew something awful was happening. And I, I, I know a lot of Georgia Bureau of Investigation agents who worked that case. Um, so I just, I, I'd love to go back and do that. And I, I love the, the characters. And, you know, one of the reasons I wrote Criminal was is I thought, why is Amanda such a ball breaker? Mm -hmm. And then I, read, I started talking in what these women had to put up with just to do their jobs. And I thought, why hasn't she killed everyone she's ever met? <laughs> yes. yes. Thank you. I think a lot about the stories, and I spend an awful lot of times in airports, airplanes, and in cars going to, to do events and things, and that's really my prime thinking time. And I write notes to myself about what I want to do, and then when I'm, I'm ready to write, I schedule two weeks at a time. I have a cabin in the North Georgia mountains, and I go up there, and I get up in the morning and start writing, and I work 12 or 18 hour days. I can only do that for two weeks. I used to could do it for longer, but then something called getting older occurred, uh, and I just couldn't physically do it. Uh, I nap a lot more. Um, I know that's not part of your question. I'm just saying naps are great if that's <laughs> happening to you. Uh, but that, that's always been my process, and you know, it, it's from when I, before I was published and could do this for a living, I had to do it very intensively. I couldn't be precious about it. I couldn't say, oh, I've got writer's block or whatever. You know, that was my time to do it, and I had to do it. One trick I had, and maybe if, if you, people in here are writers or want to be a writer, you know, the hardest part of, of writing a book is not the idea. 
because everybody in this room probably has a great idea for a book. It's sitting down and doing it. And I used to set the timer uh, for 30 minutes, and I would say, you're going to sit down and do this for 30 minutes, no matter how good or bad it is, and when the timer goes off, you can stop, right? And I've never gotten to the point where the timer goes off and I want to stop. It's just get your butt in the chair and do it. Yes, ma'am. Wow. Right? Yeah. Um, well, one, I'm trying to start a cult. Um, <laughs> If, if you go on my Facebook page, every Saturday I post a picture of a kitten. I love cats. It's my favorite. And um, I, I kept, initially with my publishing house, I kept calling the book Pieces of Purr. Um, and they're like, let's see, let's see if anybody will wear cat ears. People have been fighting over them. Yeah. And they don't even know what they're for. They're like, yeah, I got to get this. Yeah, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Maybe, because I really love the characters. I love where Andy left off. You know, in the beginning, Andy is this... It's, it's interesting, because I, I've been touring with this book for a while now. I started in June in the Netherlands, and um, younger women love Andy, and women my age just want to shake her. <laughs> um, and that, you know, we could have just, like, subtitled this book, How I Stopped Hating My Nieces, because I had that typical you don't know how easy you have it right my generation had a horrible and my god women in the the 70s like in, in cop town and criminal they had it even worse at least i'm grateful right um but it gave me an understanding about their lives you know for me when i was growing up women were not given a lot of opportunities right and even in my experience where I, my dad was telling us we could do anything the messages I was getting was, were, you can be a nurse, you can be a librarian, you can be a teacher, you know, um, hopefully you'll meet a nice guy in college to take care of you, you can have children. And none of those things interest me, or interested me. And I, I, I felt kind of pigeonholed. And so my nieces have amazing opportunities. You know, there are more women in medical school now than men, and law school is turning that way, vet school, all these professions. As they've slowly lowered in stature, more women have been entering into these fields. Um, and, and it kind of annoyed me that they didn't seem to appreciate that. But writing from Andy's perspective, it gave me an understanding about how hard it is to constantly be told you have all these choices, you can do anything. There's a fear of choosing the wrong thing. And there's a lot of paralysis that comes with that because, you know, on the one hand, yes, probably I can do the, anything I want to do. On the other hand, what if I end up in this job I hate? Or what if I, you know, there, there's also this arrogance that they think they should be the manager, that they shouldn't go in as it like the temp or something, right? But there, there are a lot of things about them that I understand because I was looking at it from Andy's perspective. And, and so with Pieces of Her, I, I wanted to write about those generational differences. And I'm certain my nieces will feel the same way about women who are 20 years younger to, than them in the future. I mean, that's just how it is. One of the things I talk about in the book, a recurring theme, is music and how parents think the music you listen to is crap. I mean, that, that's just, and it is crap. It really is. <laughs> Right? I'm working on it now. Yeah, and uh, there was sort of a cliffhanger in The Kept Woman about where Will and Sarah are, and I pick up on that. Uh, if you like Sarah's mother, she's back, making Sarah miserable. Um, and uh, just to give you a little taste, I did a tour of the CDC recently, the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta. I told them it was for a book, so they let me do it. I'm not sure if it's going to be. Um, but it was, really, it was really cool to see. And that will come next year. Awesome. Thank you. Yes. I was just curious. I've been to a couple of writers' like, workshops and stuff. And the Thank you for phrasing it that way. <laughs> yeah, because there's a big spoiler alert in there. Um, so I ended my Grant County series after six books. I did that very deliberately. I loved writing those characters so much, but they were very happy. Uh, and people think they want to read about happy people, but it's so boring when everything is good. I mean, we all know this, right? Uh, even romances, the end is the happiness. Also, they were living in this small town uh, of Hartsdale and the adjoining cities. And there were pedophiles and murderers and rapists. It was like Congress, you know? <laughs> so
So after a while, you think, if you haven't moved, you deserve to die, right? You know? And I didn't want to get tired of it. I, I love writing. I always want to challenge myself and do something different. And the book before the last book in that series, I actually took a break and I wrote R Will Trent. That was very deliberate on my part. I knew by between the third and fourth Grant County novel that there were going to be six. I knew how it was going to end. And so I planned it out with Will. And then he gets triptych. And then after Grant County ends, you get fractured, which is Will on his own. And Will turning into the type of man Sarah would be interested in. Because as much as I hate books where men write characters who, w female characters who are only there to be saved or screwed, I hate when women write male characters who are doormats. Like that's the only way you can have a strong man is to have a weak woman or the other way around. And so I wanted Will to be the kind of guy a strong, intelligent woman would be interested in. One of the things that he shares in common with Jeffrey is that, and, and I'm going to tell you all the men in here, here is the secret to having a great relationship with a, a woman. Respect her. Respect what she says and listen to her. And that's what Jeffrey did. That's what Will does. And, okay, well, he takes out the trash without being asked. So, yeah, he's fictional. Um, <laughs> But he, he respects her, right? And, and, and so I was working on making him the type of guy that Sarah might, after that, be interested in. Because he has uh, dyslexia. That's something that uh, runs in my family. Uh, and I wanted to talk about, um, I wanted to talk about that. And, you know, Will grew up in a, a time period where teachers were not equipped to identify these types of disorders. And so the diagnosis was generally that they were stupid. And to be told that you're stupid when you're not is a very damaging thing. So I wanted Will to have this secret. Um, and I've met police officers who have dyslexia. I mean, if you've ever read a crime report, you know that it doesn't stand out if you have dyslexia. I mean, generally they tend to be uh, filled with a lot of spelling errors and things, um, you know, which is okay. I'd rather they be out on the street than taking a grammar class. Um, but it, it's something that he struggles with. He can read. He just doesn't read fluently. But he has a secret, and he's investigating people with secrets. And I think that gives him an understanding of why people lie and also an ability to forgive I mean, not to say, well, you shouldn't be punished for this, but that, I think that understanding makes him a different kind of police officer. Well, research is really important to my work. I try to be as truthful as I can without being boring, right? Because honestly, Will's life would just be paperwork 95% of the time, right? Um, and I, I talk to doctors. I have a doctor uh, who's helped me with Sarah's stuff from the second novel. He's a great guy, very helpful. You know, I'll say, Sarah needs to do this and this, and I want her to open up this person's chest and to reach in for their heart. And he'll just write back and say, is the patient going to live? You know? <laughs> How far do you want to push this? Um, law enforcement officers have been great uh, for me. Very early on, when I first started touring, a lot of men would come up to me and say, do you want to see an autopsy? And I would say, are you in any way attached to the coroner's office? Um, I, I love the research element. Um, and, and it does sometimes take a while. It just depends on the type of story. Cop Town Criminal, that took a hell of a lot of research. I had a guy who was a professional researcher. He, he did stuff for Ken Follett. Um, pull a lot of archives for me. When I wrote those books, it was very important that I not just get one side. Uh, for, to me, it was very important. And so I had him pull archives from our two newspapers at the time, the Atlanta Journal, the Atlanta Constitution, and also the Atlanta Daily World, which was the African-American African newspaper, a uh, very vibrant newspaper. Atlanta has the largest African-American middle class of any uh, uh, city in the country. And I wanted to know their truth before I started talking about what was going on in the news. And, and, and those are things that take a lot of time, so I hired him to do it. One thing I will say is I watch people a lot. And usually in airports, it, I think of airports as the Internet of the world because, uh, you, you know, you can really see people who think they're in this bubble. 
And they'll do things like uh, one guy had uh, Fifty Shades of Grey and he was using a yellow highlighter. Um, <laughs> people, people take off their shoes and clip their toenails. Um, put lotion, take off their shirts, put lotion on their hairy, hairy backs. Um, <laughs> I, and I love when, when parents bring, like, uh, food for their kids and it's organic broccoli and stuff like that because they don't want them to eat the airport food. But then the kid runs off and licks the floor. <laughs> um, but one time I was in Poland, and I was at the gate waiting for my plane, and there was a man and a woman across from me. And the woman lay down on her back, and she put her head in the man's lap, and he pulled out a pair of tweezers. Uh, you know, I had my book, I was like. <laughs> and he started plucking her eyebrows. And she had this expression on her face like a cat being groomed, right? <laughs> and they gave me the nastiest look when my camera clicked. <laughs> and I, I kept clicking. It's like, I've been to Poland before. This is not normal, you know? <laughs> But those are the sorts of things I like to take note of and, you know, incorporate into the books at a later time. Well, let's end it on that note. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for coming. Please do have your book signed in the back.